Gaston Bachelard, Philosopher of the Imagination. In this video, I will be reading selections from Water and Dreams by Gaston Bachelard. So I just want to give a bit of a preface first, uh, situate the work, provide a bit of context, and then we'll get into the reading. Gaston Pachelard, 1884 to 1962. It was a French epistemologist. Originally was working in the history of science and later became known as philosopher of the imagination. So, um, drawing on the pre-Socratics, he understood the imagination in elemental terms. Uh, air, earth, water, fire, and each element he conceived of as a form of material imagination, as a concretization of the imagination of nature. And each element has its particular limits, and capacities. Water, as understood by Bachelard, is a particularly oniric element. It's associated with generation, with death, with other worlds. So I hope you will enjoy this reading. See you next time! Imagination and Matter The imagining powers of our mind develop around two very different axes. Some get their impetus from novelty. They take pleasure in the picturesque, the varied and the unexpected. The imagination that they spark always describes a springtime. In nature, these powers, far from us, but already alive, bring forth flowers. Others plumb the depths of being. They seek to find there both the primitive and the eternal. They prevail over season and history. In nature, within us and without, they produce seeds. Seeds whose form is embedded in a substance, whose form is internal. By speaking philosophically from the outset, we can distinguish two sorts of imagination. One that gives life to the formal cause, and one that gives life to the material cause, or more succinctly, a formal imagination and a material imagination. Thus abbreviated, these concepts seem to me indispensable for a complete philosophical study of poetic creation. Causes arising from the feelings and the heart must become formal causes if a work is to possess verbal variety, the ever-changing light of life. Yet besides the images of form so often evoked, by psychologists of the imagination, there are, as I will show, images of matter, images that stem directly from matter. The eye assigns them names, but only the hand truly knows them. A dynamic joy touches, molds, and refines them. When forms, mere perishable forms, and vain images, perpetual change of surfaces are put aside, these images of matter are dreamt substantially and intimately. They have weight. They constitute a heart. Of course, there are works in which the two imagining powers cooperate. It is not even possible to separate them completely. Even the most fleeting, changing, and purely formal reverie still has elements that are stable, dense, slow, and fertile. Yet even so, every poetic work 
that penetrates deeply enough into the heart of being to find the constancy and lovely monotony of matter that derives its strength from a substantial cause must bloom and bedeck itself. It must embrace all the exuberance of formal beauty in order to attract the reader in the first place. Because of this need to fascinate, the imagination ordinarily works where there is joy, or at least one kind of joy, produced either by forms and colors, variety and metamorphosis, or by what surfaces become. Imagination deserts depth, volume, and the inner recesses of substance. However, it is to the intimate imagination of these vegetating and material powers that I would like to pay most attention in this book. Only an iconoclastic philosopher could undertake the long and difficult task of detaching all the suffixes from beauty of searching behind the obvious images for the hidden ones, of seeking the very roots of this image-making power. In the depths of matter, there grows an obscure vegetation. Black flowers bloom in matter's darkness. They already possess a velvety touch, a formula for perfume. When I began meditating on the concept of the beauty of matter, I was immediately struck by the neglect of the material cause in aesthetic philosophy. In particular, it seemed to me that the individualizing power of matter had been underestimated. Why does everyone always associate the notion of the individual with form? Is there not an individuality in depth that makes matter a totality, even in its smallest divisions, meditated upon from the perspective of its depth? Matter is the very principle that can dissociate itself from forms. It is not the simple absence of formal activity. It remains itself despite all distortion and division. Moreover, matter may be given value in two ways, by deepening or by elevating. Deepening makes it seem unfathomable, like a mystery. Elevation makes it appear to be an inexhaustible force, like a miracle. In both cases, meditation on matter cultivates an open imagination. Only after studying forms and attributing each to its proper matter will it be possible to visualize a complete doctrine on human imagination. Then one can appreciate the fact that an image is a plant which needs earth and sky, substance and form. Images discovered by men evolve slowly, painfully. Therefore, I believe that a philosophic doctrine of the imagination must, above all, study the relationship between material and formal causality. The poet, as well as the sculptor, is faced with this problem. Poetic images also have their matter. I have already worked on this problem. In the psychoanalysis of fire, I have suggested classifying the different types of imagination under the heading of the material elements, which inspired traditional philosophies and ancient cosmologies. In fact, I believe it is possible to establish in the realm of the imagination a law of the four elements which classifies various kinds of material imagination by their connections with fire, air, water, or earth. And if it is true, as I am claiming, that every poetics must accept 
components of material essence, however weak. Then again, it is this classification by fundamental material elements that is best suited for showing the relationship among poetic souls. If a reverie is to be pursued with the constancy a written work requires to be more than simply a way of filling in time, it must discover its matter. A material element must provide its own substance, its particular rules and poetics. It is not simply coincidental that primitive philosophies often made a decisive choice along these lines. They associated with their formal principles one of the four fundamental elements which thus became signs of philosophic disposition. In these philosophic systems, learned thought is linked to a primitive material reverie. Serene and lasting wisdom is rooted in a substantial invariability. If we still find these simple and powerful philosophies convincing, it is because by studying them, we may rediscover completely natural imaginative powers. The same principle always holds true. In philosophic matters, only by suggesting fundamental reveries, by providing a means of access from thoughts to dreams, can one be convincing. Dreams, even more than clear ideas and conscious images, are dependent on the four fundamental elements. There have been countless essays linking the doctrine of the four material elements to the four organic temperaments. Thus the ancient author Lessius writes in the art of long life. Thus some who are choleric are chiefly affected in their sleep with the imaginary appearances of either fire or burnings, wars or slaughters. Others of more melancholy dispositions are often disturbed with the dismal prospect of either funerals or sepulchres or some dark and doleful apparitions. The phlegmatic dream were frequently of rains, lakes, rivers, inundations, drownings, shipwrecks, and sanguine abound in different kinds of pleasantries, such as flying, courses, banquets, songs, and amorous sports. Consequently, persons governed by choler, melancholy, phlegm, and blood are characterized by fire, earth, water, and air, respectively. Their dreams usually elaborate on the material element which characterizes them. If we admit that an obvious, though quite generally accepted, biological error can correspond to a profound oniric truth, then we are ready to interpret dreams materially. Therefore, along with the psychoanalysis of dreams, there should be a psychophysics and psychochemistry of dreams. This intensely materialistic psychoanalysis should return to the old precepts that held elemental diseases to be curable by elemental medicines. The material element is the determining factor in the disease, as in the cure. We suffer through dreams and are cured by dreams. In a cosmology of dreams, the material elements remain the fundamental ones. In a general way, I believe that the psychology of aesthetic emotions would gain from a study of the zone of material reveries that precede contemplation. Dreams come before contemplation. Before becoming a conscious sight, every landscape is an oniric experience. Only those scenes that have already appeared in dreams can be viewed with an aesthetic passion. And Tiek was right to recognize in human dreams the preamble 
to natural beauty. The unity of the landscape appears as the fulfillment of an oft-dreamed dream. But the Oniric landscape is not a frame that is filled up with impressions. It is a pervading substance. It is understandable, then, that a material element, such as fire, could be linked to a type of reverie that controls the beliefs, the passions, the ideals, the philosophy of an entire life. We can speak of the aesthetics of fire, of the psychology of fire, even the ethics of fire. A poetics and a philosophy of fire condense all these teachings. In themselves, these two constitute that prodigious, ambivalent teaching which upholds the heart's convictions through lessons gleaned from reality and which, conversely, lets us understand the life of the universe through the life of our own heart. All the other elements abound in similarly ambivalent certitudes. They hint at close confidences and reveal striking images. All four have their faithful followers, or more exactly. Each is profoundly and materially a system of poetic fidelity. In exalting them, we may think that we are being faithful to a favorite image. In reality, we are being faithful to a primitive human feeling, to an elemental organic reality, a fundamental oniric temperament. We shall find confirmation for this hypothesis, I believe, as we study the substantial images of water and create this psychology of material imagination for an element more feminine and more uniform than fire, a more constant one which symbolizes human powers that are more hidden, simple, and simplifying. Because of this simplicity, our task here will be more difficult and more varied. The poetic sources for water are less plentiful and more impoverished than those for the other elements. Poets and dreamers have been more often entertained than captivated by the superficial play of waters. Water, then, is an embellishment for their landscapes. It is not really the substance of their reveries. Philosophically speaking, water poets participate, quote-unquote, less in the aquatic reality of nature than do poets who hear the call of fire or earth. To bring out this participation that is the very essence of water-related thoughts, this water mindset we shall be forced to dwell on a few all-too-rare examples. But if the reader can be convinced that there is, under the superficial imagery of water, a series of progressively deeper and more tenacious images, he will soon develop a feeling for this penetration in his own contemplations. Beneath the imagination of forms, he will soon sense the opening up of an imagination of substances. He will recognize in water in its substance a type of intimacy that is very different from those suggested by the depths of fire or rock. He will have to recognize that the material imagination of water is a special type of imagination. Strengthened in this knowledge of depth of a material element, the reader will understand at last that water is also a type of destiny that is no longer simply the vain destiny of fleeting images in a never-ending dream, but an essential destiny that endlessly changes the substance of the being. From that point on, the reader will understand more intimately, more painfully, one of the characteristics of Heraclitianism. He will see that the Heraclitian flux is a concrete philosophy, a complete philosophy. One cannot bathe twice in the same river because, already, in his inmost recesses, 
the human being shares the destiny of flowing water. Water is truly the transitory element. It is the essential ontological metamorphosis between fire and earth. A being dedicated to water is a being in flux. He dies every minute. Something of his substance is constantly falling away. Daily death is not fire's exuberant form of death, piercing heaven with its arrows. Daily death is the death of water. Water always flows, always falls, always ends in horizontal death. In innumerable examples, we shall see that for the materializing imagination, death associated with water is more dreamlike than death associated with earth. The pain of water is infinite. I see no solid basis for a natural, direct, elemental rationality. Rational knowledge is not acquired all at once, nor is the right perspective on fundamental images reached in the first attempt. Rationalist? That is what we are trying to become, not only in our learning generally, but also in the details of our thinking, in the specific organization of our familiar images. This is how, through a psychoanalysis of objective knowledge and image-centered knowledge, I became rationalistic toward fire. To be honest, I must confess, I have not achieved the same result with water. I still live water images. I live them synthetically in their original complexity, often according them my unreasoning adherence. A minute detail in the life of waters often becomes an essential psychological symbol for me. Thus, the odor of water mint calls forth in me a sort of ontological correspondence which makes me believe that life is simply an aroma, that it emanates from a being as an odor emanates from a substance, that a plant growing in a stream must express the soul of water. The individual is not the sum of his common impressions, but his unusual ones. Thus, familiar mysteries are created in us, which are expressed in rare symbols. It is near water and its flowers that I have best understood that reverie is an ever-emanating universe, a fragrant breath that issues from things through the dreamer. For in my own reverie it is not infinity that I find in waters but depth. But the region we call home is less expanse than matter. It is granite or soil, wind or dryness, water or light. It is in it that we materialize our reveries, through it that our dream seizes upon its true substance. From it we solicit our fundamental color. The nameless waters know all my secrets. The same memory flows from all fountains. The child is a born materialist. His first dreams are dreams of organic substances. There are times when the creative poet's dream is so profound, so natural that he rediscovers the images of his youthful body without knowing it. Poems whose roots are this deep often have a singular strength. A power runs through them, and without thinking, the reader participates in its original force. Its origin is no longer visible. In popular legends, there are innumerable rivers which have come into being through the urination of a giant. Gargantua also inundated the French countryside at random 
during all his walks. If water becomes precious, it becomes seminal. Then the songs celebrating it are more mysterious. Only an organic psychoanalysis can illuminate an obscure image like the following. Quote, and the seminal drop enriches the mathematical figure dispersing the growing attraction of the elements of his theorem. Thus the body of glory desires under the body of clay and the night to be dissolved in visibility. End quote. One drop of powerful water suffices to create a world and to dissolve the night. To dream of power, only one drop imagined in its depth is needed. Water thus given dynamic force is a seed. It gives life like an upward surge that never flags. I love man most of all for what can be written about him. Is what cannot be written worth living? I have to be content with the study of a material imagination that is grafted on. To me this is not simply a metaphor. The graft seems to be a concept essential for understanding human psychology. In my opinion, it is the human stamp, the specifying mark of the human imagination. In my view, mankind imagining is the transcendent aspect of natura naturans. It is the graft which can truly provide the material imagination with an exuberance of forms, which can transmit the richness and density of matter to formal imagination. It forces the seedling to bloom and gives substance to the flower. All metaphors aside, there must be a union of dream-producing and idea-forming activities for the creation of a poetic work. Art is grafted nature. My book remains an essay in literary aesthetics. It has the dual objective of determining the substance of poetic images and the suitability of particular forms to fundamental matter. To show clearly what an axis of materializing imagination is, we shall begin with images that do not materialize well. We shall call up superficial images which play on the surface of an element without giving the imagination time to work upon its matter. We shall then anticipate the transition from a poetry of waters to a metapoetics of water, a transition from plural to singular. For such a metapoetics, water is not only a group of images revealed in wandering contemplation, a series of broken momentary reveries, it is a mainstay for images. A mainstay that quickly becomes a contributor of images, a founding contributor for images. Little by little, in the course of ever more profound contemplation, Water becomes an element of materializing imagination. In other words, playful poets live like water in its yearly cycle, from spring to winter, easily, passively, lightly reflecting all the seasons. But the more profound poet discovers enduring water, unchanging and reborn which stamps its image with an indelible mark and is an organ of the world. The nourishment of flowing phenomena, the vegetating and polishing element, the embodiment of tears. Material imagination learns from fundamental substances. Profound and lasting ambivalences are bound up in them. This psychological property is so constant that we can set forth its opposite as a primordial law of the imagination. 
matter to which the imagination cannot give a dual existence, cannot play the psychological role of fundamental matter. Matter that does not provide the opportunity for a psychological ambivalence cannot find a poetic double which allows endless transpositions. For the material element to engage the whole soul, there must be a dual participation of desire and fear, a participation of good and evil, a peaceful participation of black and white. Because we fail to de-objectify objects and deform forms, a process which allows us to see the matter beneath the object, the world is strewn with unrelated things. Immobile and inert solids, objects foreign to our nature. The soul therefore suffers from a deficiency of material imagination. By grouping images and dissolving substances, Water helps the imagination in its task of de-objectifying and assimilating. It also contributes a type of syntax, a continual linking up and gentle movement of images that frees a reverie bound to objects. It is this that elemental water in Edgar Allan Poe's Metapoetics imparts a particular motion to a universe. It symbolizes with a Heracleidianism that is slow, gentle, and silent as oil. Water then undergoes something like a loss of impetus, a loss of life. It becomes a sort of plastic mediator between life and death. To disappear into deep water or to disappear toward a far horizon, to become a part of depth or infinity, such is the destiny of man that finds its image in the destiny of water. Paste is a basic component of materiality, the very notion of matter, I think, closely bound up with it to the unconscious of the man who needs the clay. The model is the embryo of the work. Clay is the mother of bronze. Therefore, I cannot emphasize too much how important the experience of fluidity and pliability is to an understanding of the psychology of the creative unconscious. In experimenting with paste, la pot, Water will obviously be the dominant substance. One dreams of water when taking advantage of the docility of clay. Once we understand that for the unconscious, every combination of material elements is a marriage, we shall realize why the naive or poetic imagination nearly always attributes feminine characteristics to water. We shall also see how profoundly maternal the waters are. Water swells seeds and causes springs to gush forth. Water is a substance that we see everywhere, springing up and increasing. The spring is an irresistible birth, a continuous birth. The unconscious that loves such great images is forever marked by them. They call forth endless reveries. An imagination completely attached to one particular substance readily ascribes value to it. The human mind has claimed for water one of its highest values, the value of purity. In the light of this problem of ontological purity, the superiority of fresh water over seawater recognized by all mythologists, is understandable. The doctrine of material imagination will never be fully understood until the equilibrium between experiences and spectacles has been re-established. 
In its violence, water takes on a characteristic wrath. In other words, it is easily given all the psychological features of a form of anger. Turning malevolent, it becomes male. I shall note the special dynamic genius that a human being gains through constant contact with violent waters. This will be a new example of the fundamentally organic quality of the imagination, the muscular imagination. Conclusion will consist of proving that the voices of water are hardly metaphorical at all that the language of the waters is a direct poetic reality, that streams and rivers provide the sound for mute country landscapes and do it with a strange fidelity, that murmuring waters teach birds and men to sing, speak, recount, and that there is, in short, a continuity between the speech of water and the speech of man. This water will appear to us as a complete being, with body, soul, and voice. Perhaps more than any other element, water is a complete poetic reality. For the time being, in my opinion, the only possible way of illuminating a psychology of the imagination is through the poems it inspires. The imagination is not, as its etymology suggests, the faculty for forming images of reality. It is the faculty for forming images which go beyond reality, which sing reality. It is a superhuman faculty. A man is a man to the extent that he is a superman. A man should be defined by the sum of those tendencies which impel him to surpass the human condition. The imagination invents more than objects and dramas. It invents a new life, a new spirit. It opens eyes which hold new types of visions. The imagination will see only if it has visions, and will have visions only if reveries educate it before experiences do and if experiences follow as token of reveries. Primal poetry, poetry that allows us a taste for our inner destiny, is an adherence to the invisible. It gives us the sense of youth and youthfulness by constantly replenishing our ability to be amazed. True poetry is a function of awakening. It awakens us, but it must retain the memory of previous dreams. Upon waking from a dream, Adam found Eve. That is why woman is so beautiful. A mythology of waters in its entirety would be simply history. I have tried to write psychology to bind together literary images and dreams. I have often noticed, however, that the picturesque disrupts both mythological and poetic forces. The picturesque disperses the strength of dreams. To be active, a phantom cannot wear motley. A phantom that can be described as complacent is a phantom that has ceased to act. To the various material elements correspond phantoms that keep their strength as long as they are faithful to their matter, or what amounts to almost the same thing, as long as they are faithful to original dreams. If my research is to have any impact, it should contribute some means, some tools for renewing literary criticism. For this reason, I introduce the notion of culture complex into literary psychology. I have given this name to pre-reflective attitudes that govern the very process of reflection. In the realm of the imagination, these are, for example, 
favorite images thought to be derived from things seen in the world around us, but that are nothing but projections of a hidden soul. Culture complexes are cultivated by someone who thinks he is acquiring culture objectively. The realist, then, chooses his reality in reality. The historian chooses his history in history. The poet arranges his impressions by associating them with a tradition. Used well, the culture complex gives life and youth to a tradition. Used badly, the culture complex is the bookish habit of an unimaginative writer. Charles Baduin has stressed that a complex is essentially a transformer of psychic energy. To the cultured man, a sublimated image never seems beautiful enough. Under these conditions, a literary criticism that is not to be limited to a static balance of images must be complemented by a psychological criticism that revives the dynamic quality of the imagination following the connection between original complexes and culture complexes. If my analyses are accurate, they should help, I believe, to bridge the gap between the psychology of an ordinary reverie and the psychology of a literary reverie, a strange reverie written down and coordinated in writing that systematically goes beyond its initial dream, but remains faithful to elementary, oniric realities. To have that constancy of dream which produces a poem, one needs something more than real images before his eyes. The images born in us, that live in our dreams, filled with a dense and rich oniric matter inexhaustible food for material imagination must be pursued. Images whose basis or matter is water do not have the same durability and solidity as those yielded by earth, by crystals, metals, and precious stones. They do not have the vigorous life of fire images. Waters do not fashion, true lies, quote-unquote. To be deceived by river mirages, a soul must be quite disturbed. We cannot be captivated by such images, not even natural ones. Certain forms of water have more attraction because more material and profound reveries intervene because our inner being is more deeply engaged, and because our imagination dreams more specifically of creative acts. Then the poetic power, which was imperceptible in a poetry of reflections, appears suddenly. Water becomes heavier, darker, deeper. It becomes matter. And it is then that materializing reverie Uniting dreams of water with less mobile, more sensual reveries finally builds on water and develops a more profound and intense feeling for it. But the materiality of certain water images, the density of some phantoms, does not yield readily to measurement unless one has first probed the iridescent forms of the surface itself. This density which distinguishes the superficial from the profound in poetry is felt in the transition from sensory values to sensual values. I believe that the doctrine of imagination will be clarified only by a proper classification of sensual values in relation to sensory ones. Only sensual values offer direct communication. 
Sensory values give only translations, confusing the sensory and the sensual. Writers have claimed a correspondence among sensations, highly mental data, and have therefore failed to undertake any study that considers poetic emotion in its dynamics. Let us take the least sensual of the sensations, the visual, and see how it becomes sensual. Then let us study water in its simplest adornments. Following the faintest of clues, we will then grasp little by little its will to appear, or at least the way in which water symbolizes by means of the will to appear of the dreamer who contemplates it. In my opinion, psychoanalytic doctrine has not given equal emphasis to both terms of the dialectic, seeing and revealing oneself that is related to narcissism. The human face is above all an instrument of seduction. Looking at himself, man prepares, stimulates, polishes this face, this gaze, all these tools of seduction. One can always ask a person before a mirror the double question. For whom do you look at yourself? Against whom do you look at yourself? Are you aware of your beauty or of your strength? First, we must understand the psychological advantage of using water for a mirror. Water serves to make our image more natural, to give a little innocence and naturalness to the pride we have in our private contemplation. A mirror is too civilized, too geometrical, too easily handled an object. It is too obviously a dream device ever to adapt itself to oniric life. The mirror a fountain provides is the opportunity for open imagination. This reflection, a little vague and pale, suggests idealization. Standing before the water which reflects his image, Narcissus feels that his beauty continues has not come to an end, and must be completed. In the bright light of a room, glass mirrors give too stable an image. Here we have grasped one of the elements of natural dream, its need to be engraved deeply into nature. One cannot dream profoundly with objects. To dream profoundly, one must dream with substances. A poet who begins with a mirror must end with the water of a fountain if he wants to present a complete poetic experience. Narcissus then goes to the secret fountain in the depths of the woods. Only there does he feel that he is naturally doubled. Echo is not a distant nymph. Echo is always with Narcissus. In the presence of water, Narcissus receives the revelation of his identity and of his duality, of his double powers, virile and feminine, and above all, the revelation of his reality and his ideality. Thus, near the fountain, an idealizing Narcissism is born. I would like to indicate briefly its importance for a psychology of the imagination. Narcissism does not always produce neuroses. It also plays a positive role in aesthetics and by expeditious transposition in a literary work. Sublimation is not always the denial of a desire. It is not always introduced as a sublimation against instincts. It can be a sublimation for an ideal. Then Narcissus no longer says, I love myself as I am. He says, I am the way I love myself. 
I live exuberantly because I love myself fervently. I want to show up well. Thus, I must increase my adornment. Thus, life takes on beauty, clothes itself in images, blooms, transforms being, takes on light. This idealizing narcissism then achieves the sublimation of a caress. Joachim Gasket gives us a whole metaphysics of imagination in a single phrase of remarkable density. The world is an immense narcissus in the act of thinking about himself, thus a cosmic narcissism, which we shall study extensively in its different forms, continues very naturally from the point where egoistic narcissism leaves off. When specific reveries in the presence of a specific reality are considered one at a time, as we are attempting to do, one discovers that certain reveries have a very regular aesthetic destiny. Such is the case of reverie before a watery reflection, near a stream in its reflections, the world tends toward beauty. Little by little, beauty is enframed. It spreads from Narcissus to the world, and we understand the certainty of Friedrich von Schlegel. Quote, we know for a certainty that we live in the most beautiful of all possible worlds. Pencalism becomes an inner certainty. Schopenhauer's philosophy shows that aesthetic contemplation alleviates human sorrow for an instant by detaching man from the drama of will. This separation of contemplation from will eliminates a feature that I would like to stress, the will to contemplate. For contemplation also gives rise to a kind of will. Man wants to see. Seeing is a direct need. Curiosity sets the mind of man in motion. But in nature itself, it seems that powers of vision are active. Between contemplated nature and contemplative nature, there are close and reciprocal relations. Imaginary nature affects the unity of natura naturans and natura naturata. But is it the lake or the eye which contemplates better? The lake or pool or stagnant water stops us near its bank. It says to our will, you shall go no further. You should go back to looking at distant things, at the beyond. While you were wandering, something here was already looking on. The lake is a large, tranquil eye. The lake takes all of light and makes a world out of it, through it. The world is already contemplated, already represented. Active vision implies that the eye projects light, that it illuminates its images by itself. The world wants to see itself. Let us note in passing that the eye of a feather is also called its mirror. This is a new proof of the ambivalence which plays about the two participles, seen and seeing. The iris of the peacock feather, the eye without an eyelid, this permanent eye suddenly takes on a certain harshness. Instead of contemplating, it observes, by all indications, the fan itself wants to fascinate. The spectator then has the feeling that he is in the presence of a direct will to beauty, a force for ostentation that cannot remain passive. Contemplation is not opposed to will, but rather follows another of its branches, participating in the will for beauty, which is an element of will in general. We can certainly say that the peacock is a microcosm of universal pancalism. 
Everything which shows, sees. If the look bestowed by things is rather soft, grave, and passive, then it is the look of water. The true eye of earth is water. In our eyes, it is water that dreams. Quote, Thus water is the gaze of the earth, its instrument for looking at time. End quote. To the play of clear waters and springtime waters, all shimmering with images must be added a component, part common to the poetry of both, coolness. We shall encounter this quality of water's mass when studying myths of purity and see that coolness is a power of awakening. Coolness impregnates the springtime with its trickling waters, giving the whole season of renewal its value. Conversely, coolness is often applied negatively in the realm of air images. A cool wind implies chilling. It cools enthusiasm. Coolness is an attribute of water. Water is, in a sense, embodied coolness. It is indicative of a poetic climate. Since they are attached to substances, sensual values and not sensations provide correspondences that will not mislead. This whole correspondence is upheld by primitive water, by carnal water, the universal element. Material imagination is sure of itself when it has recognized the ontological value of a metaphor. The song of the river is likewise cool and clear. In the stream, the child nature speaks. The swan in literature is an ersatz or substitute for the nude woman. The dreamer truly contemplates what is hidden, making use of reality. He manufactures mystery. Images of covering, therefore, are about to make their appearance. We are now at the heart of the fantasy. Like all images active in the unconscious, the image of the swan is hermaphroditic. The swan is feminine when brilliant waters are contemplated, but it is masculine in action. For the unconscious, action is an act. For the unconscious, there is only one act. An image that suggests an act must evolve in the unconscious from feminine to masculine. The swan song, song of sexual death, of exalted desire about to find gratification appears but rarely in its complexual significance. The swan image is always a desire. The swan song is sexual desire at its culminating point. To have its full poetic strength, a complex like the swan complex that I have just identified, must act in secret within the poet's heart. Jung gives several arguments that help us understand on the cosmic plane why the swan is the symbol both of light on water and of a hymn of death. This is in fact the myth of the dying sun. The language of a great poet like Poe is rich, no doubt, but it is hierarchical as well. His favored substance is heavy water that is more profound, dormant, and still than any other deep dormant or still waters in nature. Water in Poe's imagination is a superlative, a kind of substance of substance, a true mother substance. Death for Poe is what is human. A material element finally invites death to approach as though it were an essence, a life snuffed out, a memory so complete as to live on unconsciously, 
without ever exceeding the power of dreams. Therefore all water that was originally clear is for Po water that must become clouded, water that will absorb black suffering. Running water is water destined to slow down, to become heavy. All living water is on the point of dying. Now in dynamic poetry, things are not what they are, but what they are becoming. To contemplate water is to slip away, dissolve and die. But there is only one memory. The story of water is the human tale of a dying water, of life wanting to die. First let us show Poe's love for an elementary water, for an imaginary water that attains the ideal of creative reverie, because it possesses what could be called the absolute of reflection. In fact, when certain poems and tales are read, the reflection seems more real than reality because it is purer. As life is a dream within a dream, so the universe is a reflection within a reflection. The universe is an absolute image. By immobilizing the image of the sky, the lake creates a sky in her bosom. The water in its youthful limpidity is a reversed sky, where the stars take on new life. Thus, dreaming at the water's edge, Poe forms this strange double concept of a star isle, a liquid star, a prisoner of the lake, a star which could be an island in the sky. Water, by means of its reflection, doubles the world, doubles things. It also doubles the dreamer. Not simply as a vain image, but through his involvement in a new oniric experience. Of course, an inattentive reader may only see yet another worn-out image. That is because he has not really taken pleasure and the delicious visual effects of the reflections. If the reader made all of the poet's images real, in the end he would experience physically the invitation to travel. The mirage corrects the real. In so pure a mirror, the world is my vision. Pure vision, solitary vision, this is the double gift of reflecting waters. We understand that matter is the unconscious of form. It is water itself in its mass, no longer its surface, which sends us the insistent message of its reflections. Only matter can become charged with multiple impressions and feelings. It is an emotional good. In the presence of deep water, you choose your vision. You can see the unmoving bottom or the current, the bank or infinity, just as you wish. You have the ambiguous right to see or not to see. You have the right to live with the boatmen or with a new race of fairies, laborious, tasteful, magnificent and fastidious. The water sprite, guardian of the mirage, holds all the birds of heaven in her hand. A pool contains a universe. A fragment of a dream contains an entire soul. Water becomes a kind of universal home. It peoples the sky with its fish. A symbiosis of images gives the bird to the deep, and the fish to the firmament, the inversion which played on the ambiguous inert concept of the star isle here plays on an ambiguous living concept, the bird fish. 
Reflecting on these musings that produce unexpected images allows one to understand that the imagination needs a constant dialectic. For a thoroughly dualized imagination, concepts are not centers of images which come together because of their resemblance to each other. Concepts are the points where images intersect, at incisive and decisive right angles. Besides this intersection, this particular concept has one other characteristic. The fish flies and swims. The past life of the soul is itself a deep water. And then after seeing all the reflections, the dreamer suddenly looks at the water itself. A sort of volumetric narcissism permeates matter itself. Have you seen the largest one which blooms beneath all the others? A soul also is such a great substance. One dares not look at it. We are now going to follow the destiny of water in Poe's poetics. We are going to see it as a destiny that makes matter more profound, increases its substance by filling it with human sorrow. We are going to see qualities of surface and volume opposed. Volume according to this astonishing formula that is an important consideration in the eyes of the Almighty. The water will get darker, and in order to do so it will absorb shadows in material fashion. An objective intimacy digs down into the element in order to receive materially the secrets of the dreamer. Give us this day our daily shadow. One that is part of oneself, is this not living with death? Death, then, is a long and sorrowful story. Not merely the drama of a fatal hour. Water is no longer a substance that is drunk. It is a substance which drinks. It swallows the shadow like a black syrup. Thus Paul's Clodel cries, O oh Lord, have pity upon these waters within me which are dying of thirst. Their waters fulfill an essential psychological function, to absorb shadows, to offer a daily tomb to everything that dies within us each day. Thus water is an invitation to die. Each hour meditated is like a living tear that rejoins the water of regret. Time falls, drop by drop, from water clocks. The world that time animates is a weeping melancholy. Now it is the element which remembers the dead. Without knowing it, Poe, through the power of his inspired dream, rediscovers the Heraclitean intuition which saw death and the tendency to become water. Heraclitus of Ephesus imagined that the soul, even now in sleep, by detaching itself from the sources of living and universal fire, tended momentarily to transform itself into humidity. For Heraclitus, then, death is water. To become water is death to the soul. What becomes richer becomes heavier, this water enriched by so many reflections, and so many shadows is a heavy water. It is the truly characteristic water of Poe's metapoetics, the heaviest of all waters. All drama is on the borderline between the unconscious and the conscious. Why could not water, the universal liquid, also admit an unusual property? The water so discovered will be an invented liquid. If water is the fundamental matter of Edgar Allan Poe's unconscious, as we claim that it is, it should rule over earth. It is the blood of the earth. It is the life of the earth. Water draws the entire countryside along towards its own destiny. Beauty is a cause of death. 
at his death camouflaged in all the colors of life. These waters, these lakes, are fed by cosmic tears that fall from all of nature. The very sun weeps on the waters. This influence brings to water as alchemy might, the coloring of universal suffering, the coloring of tears. It makes the water of all these lakes, of all these marshes, into the mother water of human sorrow. Dead waters are sleeping waters. The lake with stagnant waters is the symbol of this total sleep, a sleep from which no one wishes to wake, sleep guarded by the love of the living and lulled by litanies of memory. The synthesis of form, event, and substance may seem artificial, even impossible, to the philosopher, yet it is found everywhere. If one loves, then immediately one also admires, fears, and defends. In reverie, the three causes which determine form, becoming, and matter are so closely knit that they are inseparable. This, therefore, is why water is the matter of a beautiful and faithful death. Only water can sleep and all the while keep its beauty. Only water can die be still and yet keep its reflections. In reflecting the face of a dreamer who is true to the great memory, to the universal shadow, water gives beauty to all shadows. It gives new life to all memories. Thus a kind of delegated and recurrent narcissism is born which makes all those whom we have loved beautiful. Man sees himself in his past, any image for him is a memory. I believe that the imagination in its creative form imposes a destiny on all it creates. I shall show through this theme of silence that the water in poetry becomes silent. For what speaks in the depths of a being and from its depths? What speaks in the bosom of the waters is the voice of remorse. They must be silenced. Evil must be answered by a curse. And the universe understands the reproaches of a wounded soul. It falls silent. Silent water, somber water, stagnant water, unfathomable water, so many material lessons for a meditation on death. But it is not the lesson taught by a Heraclitian death, by a death which bears us afar with the current and like a current. It is the lesson of a still death, a death in depth, that stays with us, near us, in us. Was not death the first navigator? Death would not be the last journey, it would be the first. Now really powerful interests are visionary interests. These are the interests about which one dreams. They are not those about which one makes calculations. These are mythical interests. The hero of the sea is a hero of death. Only water can cleanse the earth. Having crossed over the waters, they had crossed over death. Death is a journey, and a journey is death. To die is truly to leave, and no one leaves well, courageously, cleanly, except by following the current, the flow of the wide river. All rivers join the river of the dead. This is the only mythical death, the only departure that is an adventure. It awakens in us, no doubt, the most painful of echoes, for the dreamer, there is a continuing transposition between this departure and death. The departure of sleep. It's being referred to here. For some dreamers, water is the new movement that beckons us toward a journey never made. Having passed through earth or fire, the soul arrives at the water's edge. The sea is the sea of oniric water. All the mysterious boats found so abundantly in novels about the sea 
participate in the ship of the dead. The ferryman is the guardian of a mystery. Water is the tomb of fire and of men. Death is afraid of dying. Death is a journey which never ends. Water, the land of living nymphs, is also the land of dead nymphs. It is the true matter for a very feminine death. Ladies of fountains endlessly comb their long blonde hair. They often leave their comb of gold or ivory on the bank. On the rocks in the ford, the river plays like living tresses. Woe to the rash man who got too close to her, for he was enveloped in her hair and thrown into the water. Through what mystery is hair combed by a servant girl, able to evoke the brook, the past, and consciousness. The repeated passage of the comb through her mass of hair was like an incantation, which had always been and would continue forever. Her face in the depths of the mirror drew away, deprived of its contours, then drew nearer, coming back from the bottom and was no longer her face. We see it all, the brook is there in its entirety with its endless fleeing, its depth, its ever-changing mirror, creator of changes. Many psychologies of the imagination, due to the exclusive attention they give to the problem of form, are condemned to be only psychologies of concept or structure. They are scarcely more than psychologies of the image-filled concept. In the end, the literary imagination which can develop only in the realm of the image of an image and must translate forms is more suitable for the study of our need to imagine than the pictorial imagination. The hair can belong to an angel in heaven if it is flowing. It leads naturally to its aquatic image. At the edge of the waters, everything is tresses. The synthetic image of water, woman, and death cannot be broken up. Water makes death more human and mingles clear sounds in with the dullest of groans. We see the intimate play of a reverie that marries the moon and the flood and follows their story the whole length of the current. Such a reverie realizes in the full sense of the word the melancholy of night and of the river. It humanizes reflections and shadows. It knows their drama and pain. This reverie participates in the struggle of the moon and the clouds. It gives them the will to struggle. Attributing this will to all phantasms, to all images that move and change. For certain souls, water truly holds death in its substance. It communicates a reverie where horror is slow and tranquil. In the third Duino elegy, Rilke, it seems, lived the smiling horror of the waters, the horror which smiles with the tender smile of a weeping mother. Death in calm water has maternal features. The peaceful horror is dissolved in water, which lightens the living seed. Here, water mixes its ambivalent images of birth and death. It is a substance full of reminiscences and prescient reveries. When a reverie or dream is thus absorbed into a substance, the entire being receives a strange permanence from it. The dream falls asleep, becomes stabilized. It tends to participate in the slow and monotonous life of an element. Now that its element has been found, all its images will be based on it. It becomes material. It becomes cosmic. Begoin has recalled that the true oniric synthesis for Keras is a deep synthesis in which psychic being is incorporated into a cosmic reality. For certain dreamers, water is the universe of depth. Ophelization then is substantial. Water is nocturnal. 
Near it, everything leans toward death. Water communicates with all the powers of night and death. Thus, for Paracelsus, the moon impregnates the substance of the water with a noxious influence. Water which has been exposed to lunar rays for a long time remains poisoned water. These material images, so strong in Paracelsian thought, still live in poetic reverie today. Quote, the moon gives to those whom it influences a taste for water from the sticks. End quote, says Victor Emile Michelet. No one ever recovers from having dreamed next to dormant water. Death is in it. Water carries things far away. Water passes like the days. But another reverie takes hold of us to teach us the loss of our being in total dissolution. Each of the elements has its own type of dissolution, earth into dust, fire into smoke. Water dissolves more completely. It helps us to die completely. Water makes death elemental. Water dies with the dead in its substance. Water is then a substantial nothingness. No one can go further into despair than this. For certain souls, water is the matter Formal of imagination despair. imagination needs the idea of composition. Material imagination needs the idea of combination. It assimilates so many substances, draws so many essences to itself. The spectator who loves to contemplate the combination of diverse substances is always amazed when he meets liquids that do not mix with one another. This is because for materializing reverie, all liquids are water. All that flows is water. Water is the only liquid element. I want to show how dreams are associated with knowledge to show how the material imagination affects combinations among the four fundamental elements. Material imagination unites water and earth, or water and its opposite, fire, or earth and fire. Sometimes it sees in vapors and fogs the union of air and water, but never in any natural image does it see the triple material union of water, earth, and fire carried out. A fortiori, no image can incorporate all four elements. If a three-way union appears, we can be sure that the image produced is an artificial one. Where the imagination is concerned, the two substances to be opposite is for them to be of the opposite sex. If two matters with feminine tendencies like water and earth mingle, then one of them becomes slightly masculine in order to dominate its partner. Only when this occurs can the combination be solid and durable. Only then can the imaginary combination be a real image. In the realm of the material imagination, every union is a marriage and there is no marriage à toi. We shall examine successively the unions of water and fire water and night, and especially water and earth, for it is in this last combination that the double reverie of form and matter suggests the most powerful themes for creative imagination. For it is with the mixture of water and earth that we are best able to understand the principles of a psychology of material cause. Thermal water is imagined, first of all, as the immediate composition of water and fire. The image of the sun, the fire star coming out of the sea, is the dominant image here. The sun is the red swan. But the imagination moves endlessly between cosmos and microcosm. It alternately projects the small on the large, the large on the small. If the sun is the glorious bridegroom of the sea, then the water must give herself to the fire. 
the fire must take the water in proportion to this libation. Fire begets his mother. For many cosmogonic reveries, it is warm humidity that is the fundamental principle. If night is personified, it is a goddess whom nothing resists, who envelops everything, who hides everything. She is the goddess of the veil. Night is made of night. Night is a substance, is a nocturnal matter. We absorb the night because there is something of the hydrus in us. The union of water and earth produces an admixture that is one of the fundamental schemes of materialism. The problem of form is given a secondary role. There is no reverie without ambivalence, no ambivalence without reverie. For Fabricius, pure water itself is glue. This hold which water has on matter cannot be fully understood if one is satisfied with visual observation. Tactile observation must be added to it. In molding, there is no more geometry, no more sharp edges, no more breaks. It is a continuing dream. It is an intimate reverie, and furthermore, it is rhythmic, with a heavy rhythm that takes hold of the whole body. It is thus vital. It has the dominant characteristic of duration rhythm. This reverie which is born out of a working with soft substances, pot, is also necessarily correlated with a special will for power, with the masculine joy of penetrating a substance, feeling the inside of substances. Then begin the binding action and the molding, whose slow but regular progress brings a special joy that is less satanic than the joy of dissolving. The hand becomes directly conscious of the growing success of the union of earth and water. Another duration is then engraved into matter, an uninterrupted, steady, never-ending duration. This duration is not formed. This duration is substantial becoming. True workers are those who have taken the matter in hand. By meditating on the different trades that mold, one can better understand the material cause and see all of its varieties. The sculptor in front of his marble block is a scrupulous servant of the formal cause. He finds form by eliminating the formless. The modeler before his clay block finds form by deforming by a dreamy evolution of the amorphous. The modeler is the one nearest to the inner dream, to the vegetating dream. Mud is the dust of water, as ash is the dust of fire. A dream of softness, a vague memory of fluidity is imprisoned in forged iron. Dreams that have lived and the man's soul continue to live in his works. Creatures discovered under a clump of earth in the corners of a crystal are encrusted in matter. They are the elementary forces of matter. A material reverie inlays its objects. It carves them. This reverie is always the one that carves. Material reverie conquers an inner space even in the hardest substances, even in those that are the most resistant to the dream of penetration. Forms reach completion, matter never. Matter is the rough sketch for unrestricted dreams. Maternal and feminine water. It is not knowledge of reality that makes us love reality passionately. It is feeling the first and fundamental value as for nature, we begin by loving it without knowing it, without really seeing it, by actualizing in things a love that has its basis elsewhere. Then we search for its details because we love it as a whole, without knowing why. And if the feeling for nature is as durable as it is in some people, 
That is because in its original form it is at the root of all feelings. It is a filial devotion. All forms of love have in their makeup something of the love for a mother. Nature is for the grown man. Madame Bonaparte states, An immensely enlarged, eternal mother projected into infinity. Emotionally, nature is a projection of the mother. Filial love is the first active principle in the projection of images. It is the ability of the imagination to project an inexhaustible force that seizes all images and puts them in the most reliable human perspective, the maternal perspective. Other loves will come, of course, and be grafted upon the first ability to love, but none of these loves will ever be able to destroy the priority of our first feelings. The chronology of the heart is indestructible. To love an image is always to illustrate a love. To love an image is to find, without knowing it, a new metaphor for an old love. To love the infinite universe is to give a material meaning, an objective meaning to the infinity of the love for the mother. To love a solitary place is to compensate for a painful absence. As soon as anyone loves a reality with all his soul, then this reality is itself, a soul and a memory. I shall show that these highly valorized images have more matter than form. I shall show that these observed metaphors illustrate an unforgettable love. All liquid is a kind of water for the material imagination. This is a fundamental principle of material imagination which requires that one of the primitive elements be at the root of all substantial images. This remark has already been justified visually and dynamically. For the imagination, everything that flows is water. Everything that flows participates in nature's water, as a philosopher would say. All water is a kind of milk. Every joyful drink is mother's milk. It is this superficial region where consciousness and unconsciousness mingle that I have studied most often in my works on the imagination. But it is time to show that the deeper zone is always active and that a material image of milk underlies the more conscious images of the waters. It is matter that governs form. The breast is rounded because it is swollen with milk. Milk is the first sedative. The imaginary does not find its deep, nutritive roots and images. First, it needs a closer, more enveloping and material presence. Imaginary reality is evoked before being described. Poetry is always evocative. It is, as Martin Buber would say, in the thou category before being in the that category. Thus, the moon is, in the poetic realm, matter bef before being form. It is a fluid that penetrates the dreamer. The moon is an influence, in the astrological sense of the word, a cosmic matter which, at certain hours, impregnates the universe and gives it a material unity. The second woman, the beloved or the wife, is also projected upon nature. Novelis is seized by an uncontrollable desire to bathe. No vision invites him. It is the substance itself, which he has touched with his hands and lips, which summons him. It summons him materially by virtue, it seems, of a magic participation. The dreamer undresses and goes down into the basin. It is only then that images come. They emerge from the matter. They are born as if from a seed, from a primitive sensual reality, from a drunkenness that cannot yet be projected. Feminine forms are born from the very substance of water. Forms in themselves are clothes. 
Such material images, soft and hot, warm and humid, cure us. They belong to that imaginary medicine. So oniracly true and forcefully dreamed that it retains a considerable influence over our unconscious life. Water and warmth are the two things vital to our well-being. We must know how to be economical with them. We must understand that one tempers the other. Water has taken on the property of dissolved feminine substance. Forms are shifting because the unconscious becomes disinterested in them. What binds the unconscious, what imposes a dynamic law on them in the realm of images is life in the depths of a material element. Of the four elements, water is the only one that can rock. Water carries us, rocks us, puts us to sleep, gives us back to our mother.